through it, uplink to downlink through satellites to the other NASA centers around the country. Ahead to the right, uh, building with antennas on its roof, central instrumentation. And among other things in there, we zero in and calibrate the thousands of instruments on our horse station. And we'll talk about these on the way back later. Just to tantalize you, you can get a very close view from the Saturn V Center. Over your left shoulder, about the 8 o'clock position still over the trees, is 39A with Atlantis. This is where the boosters are cleaned up. We do have some nose cones, aft skirts, and the uh, instrument sections here that are retired. We can fly them up to 20 times, but then for stress uh, purposes, we don't fly them anymore. And looking down this next Move to Houston, and off to the left, about the 10 o'clock position in the scrub, let's just make out the roof of the TAN building, which was manned. Mid Trying to build this blockhouse as strong as possible. Part of the ceiling is eight feet thick, steel reinforced concrete. The walls are two feet thick. Okay, here we have our little monkey couch. This is the capsule that we put the monkey in to go up into space. Now, why do we want to do that? You know, back in the early days of our space program, we had no idea what a weightless condition would do to the human body. For all we knew, your heart would stop, or maybe you couldn't breathe. <coughs> up there long enough though to realize everything underneath me was built by the lowest bidder under a government contract. <laughs> Still true. Shepard, his history rating right to the edge of space and that was right up to the minute before launch. Then the guys would scramble into the blockhouse and slam the door. Now, if you look out the window, you can oh, see no the guard. With Shepard sitting up there in Freedom 7, we were just like, I mean, every second felt like an hour. And even after that 3 2 1 countdown, a lot had to happen in here. show you. We test fired Polaris missiles off the ground into the water before being to one. The second stage is large as the first, man rated. You'd have a Titan II that launched our two-man Gemini craft. Put some solid boosters on, you'd wind up with a Titan III and really big solid boosters, a Titan IV. And the last Titan IV, let's practice. And up in front to the left, a long white bullet of a Minuteman I missile. Now these were uh, actually deployed from underground silos, much as the Titan IIs were. 
launching over the poles to retaliate for an attack from the Soviets. We first tested this idea out, though, by Cape Canaveral's ocean side. We'll show you where some of those silos are out here later. And of course, since we've been getting some rain out here, they're starting to look like chia pets, too. Off directly to the left, the last gas for windows. They were flat on the roof of this small blockhouse. The angled metal up there had mirrors so you could look up and out in front of us. This building actually had a launch tower on top for a nifty rocket called Navajo. Wings and ramjets, but seven out of ten of these things went up and down like that. The white upper area of the tower itself is the clean room uh, for the upper stage, the GPS satellite when they put it back on, keeping birds and dust and sand out. Bright turquoise rocket, uh, again radar reflective. We have all nine solid boosters still around the base. Now the brick building by the base of the lighthouse is where they had the original casks of whale oil and kerosene. The lighthouse keeper's home was lost when it became an Air Force station. And this is the only lighthouse in the U.S. Rose. Exhaust ports. We were trying anything that worked back then. And a lot that didn't. Now directly ahead of us, down the straight road where we're not allowed to go, is where it began. July 1950, Complex 1, 2, 3, and 4. From Pad 3, a V-2 rocket with a WAC Corporal upper stage. And that was redone in 2000. Ahead of us, there's the concrete ramp coming up from the right to the left. The railing's still up there, shining. The now, nobody would be sitting on top of the blockhouse at launch, even if he didn't like them. This was for visiting dignitaries between missions. The very first name listed on our scoreboard, Virgil I. Grissom. He didn't like the name Virgil. Uh, flight there, John Young, he was a rookie in the next nine group. He later became the first American to fly six times in space. Here, circling the moon with Apollo, landing on the moon with another Apollo mission. He also became the very first commander of a space shuttle, STS. Really mostly rust. Of course, that red clean room area we saw back that was fixed up at the museum, but this is all that's left of the tower. Because the ocean is right beyond it, beyond the dunes, as we'll show you with our next stop. Uh, it was, of course, Gus Grissom, Ed White, Roger Chafee, a rookie learning the ropes from them, and they were in their capsule doing a plugs out test less than a month before, January 27th. Uh, had. In the picture, the blockhouse is off the picture to the left with the cable run going right to the rocket. It starts out above ground, then dives under the pad's concrete, and under the launch pad itself, really empty space. Equipment rooms, a pump room, the cables coming in, and the Air Force thinks our heavy bus on the old concrete, well, we just might wind up down there with the snakes, so we're gonna have to park a little bit short and walk in. Of course, the big red tower, the wall behind. Now, ahead to our left, these ramps are actually flamed of
pad and stand them up out there. Now this used to be Boeing, but to save even more money, Boeing and Lockheed Martin Bullet was in there with his staff. Von Braun and his rocket scientists had models of the Saturn V and vehicle assembly building, and he was the other EELV that was being developed. They figured the Delta Force sort of type, of course, appearing out of the bushes there, uh, big mass standing by itself. And those, uh, that is pad 40, where we launched Titan 3s and 4s. A lot of history over there. Also, the first Vikings to land on Mars. And no, not the guys with the helmets, the spacecraft. Most recently, planetary-wise, Cassini, now in orbit around Saturn, changing the textbooks, it seems, every day. And this is going to have an interesting future. Those gray buildings are being reworked. The third one was movable launch cradle on rails and moved out to those lightning masts about 24 hours before launch. And we're out at the pads, as you'll see at Saturn V Center. You can see some, it looks like, greenish paint on the bays that are closest to us near the top. That greenish look is at bay number two by the roadway had Endeavour inside. Number one to the right of it had Atlantis. And the third building up there does have Discovery. But, you know, orbiters have a 78 it's a tight fit rolling them in and out. 